What's up everybody, my name is Sarah. I hope you are all having a spectacular day. And as we approach the last couple of days of 2019, I hope you are finding quality time with friends and family and maybe a little bit of time snuck in there for your bike. And this time of season is the perfect time of season to talk about the indoor trainer setup. And I thought I would make a what's in my pain cave video or really what's in my living room at the moment, but we'll talk about that in a minute. And I wanted to share the equipment that I'm using, why I might use some of the equipment and how my setup works, because we're weird. We're cyclists and endurance athletes. And for some reason we have this preoccupation with talking about gear and seeing what other people are using. It's all in good fun. So I figured I'd share my setup for this indoor training season with you guys today. So while I'm sitting here in front of the computer, I will start with that. I will talk about the device that is running my favorite programs. I have mentioned in previous videos, but I'll reiterate here. I use two primary programs to run my indoor training, and that is Zwift here. I use that for my free rides, and I use that to um, have something to look at. I, it's great for some of the group rides, races, free rides, uh, even do structured work, workouts on so that you have something a little bit more compelling to look at than just a graph on a screen. And then I use Trainer Road for some of the structured workout uh, framework as well as the training plans. They're a little bit more uh, grounded in the scientifically backed training plans and workouts and Zwift is more of the fun side. So I like to combine those two things to have a really good robust training plan that I will remain adherent to. The equipment on the computer, this is an Acer Predator. I've had it for a couple of years now. I bought it pretty well specced out at the time, so it would last me a few years. And inside is an i7 uh, processor with a four gigahertz uh, chipset, and that is able to uh, have turbo boost capacity to 4.2 gigahertz. There is uh, 16 gigs of RAM currently. I'm looking to upgrade to 32 gigs of RAM, which really isn't relevant to the Zwift portion at the moment, but I'll talk about that in a second. I have a uh, NVIDIA GeForce GTX 10 1080 graphics card which runs 4k especially for Zwift very well it's not the top of the line graphic graphics card at this point if you're a high-end gamer it's probably something that you laugh at but for most people's purposes myself included in the very minimal gaming that I do it works really well and it produces very nice crisp 4k uh, it has a 256 gigabyte SSD that is solely for the purpose of running my operating system and the core programs I also have a one terabyte SSD in the computer that is for my working files. So I use uh, the Adobe suite for Adobe Lightroom, Photoshop, After Effects, and Premiere Pro for my own hobbyist photography and videography. So that is uh, very resource dependent and to move that pr those programs along much quicker, you put your working files on the SSD. I also have a two terabyte uh, regular serial hard drive in there for less resource, resource dependent working files. And then all of my my long-term or permanent storage goes off the computer onto things like external hard drives and the cloud. And that keeps the computer moving quickly and very clean and not really bogged down with a lot of unnecessary files. But uh, it is absolutely unnecessary for Zwift. It just happens to be what I use for other things and then it carries over. So I really do get to maximize on the equipment. But nobody gives a shit about the computer, right? Let's get to the actual trainer setup. All right, we're on the floor sitting Indian style like grown-ups in the middle of my living room to talk about my trainer setup. And let's start with the living room portion. Why the heck am I in the middle of my own living room with my trainer setup when I actually have room to set up an isolated area in another room of the house? Well, there are two reasons for that. The first one being that the living room is just this is the room where I find the most enjoyment in my home. This is where I do most of my recreational or leisure activities. So whether it's watching a movie or a TV show, whether it's using my piano or my computer or playing games, whatever it might be, if I'm in the home enjoying my free time, I'm doing it in this room. So there's automatically a positive and comfortable association. And adding something that isn't always the most comfortable, which is indoor training, to an environment like this can make the uh, experience and the impetus to get on a little bit more enjoyable. The other reason is out of sight, out of mind. So I can tuck this trainer away in another room where I don't spend a lot of my time. And then as I'm in my living room or I'm moving through my day and I'm feeling tired and maybe I'm not feeling super motivated to get on my bike, it's hiding in the other room and I don't have to look at it and tell it I don't want to ride it that day. And I can't ignore it if it's sitting here in the living room. It's sitting there and it might just give me that extra impetus to say, okay, just get it done and getting, get it over with. And I'll tell you what, 99% of the time when I don't feel like getting on for a ride and then I just get it done with, 
I feel a lot better afterwards. Now it doesn't live here in the middle of the living room. This is where I just slide it into place when I'm ready to ride. It takes me a minute or two to break it down and slide it back that way a little bit out of the way. So I'm gonna start at the back of the bike and move my way forward, kind of going through the different things that I use. I'll spend the most time talking about the trainer itself because that's where the magic happens, right? That's the most important part of the indoor trainer setup. You really can't do anything without the indoor trainer. So I'm gonna start with that. So currently I am using the Cyclops H2. Cyclops has recently been rebranded in the last few months as Saris as part of their parent company name. And they did refresh this unit. So they took the uh, belt and replaced it with a, a, a silent belt system rather than the very quiet one that's in the H2. And then they've also added some additional mechanical cooling. Uh, in the beginning when they released the H2, there were some overheating issues for some folks and they uh, fixed that with a firmware upgrade, but they have been able to now ameliorate any future issues by having some more hardware in here for the cooling cooling, but it's not a full upgrade of the unit. You haven't really added any features other than, uh, or functionality other than uh, those two uh, features that they've added. So this is one of those trainers that is in that top tier of trainers. And that's not to denigrate any other trainer brands or models, but there are really three trainers that sit kind of at that top tier of the market that used to be in that $1,200 range. Now that's starting to change. And that is the Hammer Series, that is the Kicker Series, most recently the Kicker 18, and then the Tax Neo, now the 2T. And those three have kind of been at the top and each of them have their own thing that they do the best that makes people choose one or the other. So I choose the Saris and I'll talk about that for really the biggest primary reason is that the flywheel is the best on the market at the moment. And that's just not, that's not even just an opinion. That's really just objectively speaking, it has the, the heaviest flywheel that provides the, the highest inertia and the best real road feel of any trainer currently on the market. They've done a really good job engineering that to try to give the best approximation of that power transfer through the drivetrain into the back of the uh, bike where the wheel would be and to make that feel really nice. And having personally ridden alternate trainers, uh, especially direct drive trainers, I've ridden on a Kicker, I've ridden on a Neo 2T before and they are nice trainers, but this flywheel, it sets itself apart. They do a really great job with that. The other reason I choose Saris is uh, it is a United States based company. Being a resident of the US, I'm always looking to support US jobs in engineering and manufacturing and 95% of their business is based right here. So I love to be able to support that and their customer service. If you just take a look around, I know that that's anecdotal, but people have had great customer service experiences with uh, the Cyclops units, the power tap units, all of this stuff under the Saris brand. They really are devoted to creating customers for life and not so much in terms of uh, just kind of generating constant turnover. So they've done a great job with that. They do well at creating items that play well with other technology. So their newest uh, rocker plate they've made it a point to make sure that every trainer will fit on that rocker plate which is a really nice thing to do instead of forcing you to buy their brand of trainer and the best thing that they've done recently and you're going to start to see things change is when they went from Cyclops to Saris they brought this price point in on this trainer that used to be a $1,200 trainer and got really aggressive and brought that in at $999 they have just turned the entire top tier trainer market on its head because they've already have the uh, investment in here for the uh, manufacturing of these products. So they're gonna pass that savings onto the customer to generate more sales. And it's really gonna start to force the pricing in the market down. You see the same thing with the Favero Asioma pedals. They're really gonna start forcing these power meter companies to bring their prices down when you have a solid, high quality competitive unit at such a, a low price point. If you're coming in from outside the market, you might look and think that this isn't as good of a trainer, but it absolutely is. They're just making a statement. And now that the trickle down truck technology effect is starting to hit these direct drives, it's kind of like TVs. They're gonna be cheaper than you've ever seen them before. And it's almost going to be impossible not to get into the market with a nice direct drive unit. So talking about Wahoo, I really like the Wahoo brand. Other than the flywheel, I think that Wahoo makes a great product. It's a right on par. These top tier trainers have great accuracy between one and 2% plus or minus. They have a maximum grade of around that 20% mark. And then they do a max wattage capacity of somewhere around 2000 to 2200 watts. And if you're pushing 2200 watts, what the hell are you doing watching this video? You have way cooler friends to hang out than with me. 
Say hi to Mark Cavendish for me. But realistically, the wattage and, and gradient is pretty much overbuilt for most uses in terms of things like the programs we use and most people's power capacity. So they're more than forward compatible and future proof for what people are going to need. Most of them at this point are pretty quiet. And what they have that works above the Saris and the tax units is their ecosystem. So they've come up some, with some really cool units in the Kicker Climb, in the Kicker Headwind, which are awesome products, especially if you're really ingrained in Zwift. It just makes the entire experience really immersive. And it's a really cool set of products. It's not enough to get me to switch at this moment because like I said, I really enjoy this flywheel. And for me personally, if I'm going to invest in an upgrade to my trainer system, the first thing I'm gonna look at is that rocker plate because I wanna be able to last on the bike a little bit longer and a little bit more comfortably first before I start adding more immersion to my system. So I would rather go with the Saris Infinity MP1 first and then perhaps down the line if that climb or headwind or both are available, perhaps that's something I would look at. But it's not something I need that's more of a nice to have. But Wahoo does a really good job making quality products and making some really neat immersive technology for your interface, especially if you do a lot of training year round indoors. In terms of tax, they have really neat technology and feature sets in their trainers. One of the coolest things they have, especially for those people who don't have a power meter on their bike, is their level of accuracy from the factory and the need or the lack of need to calibrate. So the way it produces power through more of a magnet system, it doesn't lose its power number over time. So given that it's calibrated well at the factory, that power number will always be reliable. You can really trust in the tax system to be right every single time, unless the thing is just unbelievably broken. The other thing that's really cool about it is the fact that you do not need to have a power source attached to it. It will run all the core functions with no power cord attached. So it'll act as a smart trainer. It will pair up with your devices and your uh, programs and you can run it. And it's really cool that if, you just, if you're like me and you drag it out on a daily basis, it's one less thing to have on the floor. The only thing that it won't power is that kind of real feel, that um, vibration that it gives on the, uh, the cobbles and whatnot, which shh, don't tell tax, but I think most people are turning that off. But that's the only thing that doesn't run without a power source. But I think that's a really neat feature to have. It's a pretty sharp looking trainer if you like that design. But if you, as you can see, all three trainers do something really, really well. And it just depends on which one of those functions that you want the most. Maybe one day they'll all do everything great, but right now each trainer company has their advantages. And there's a lot of other trainer companies that make great quality products that are coming into the market and trying to make their niche here. I'm just talking about these top three because it's the most comparable to what I have. But that's enough trainer talk. Let me buzz through the rest of the bike that this is gonna be probably the longest conversation and I'll let you know what else I'm using. So on the direct drive trainer, obviously I have the cassette. I am currently using one of my extra Altegra uh, 1128 cassettes. I use the 1128 because I live in an area with a lot of climbing. So I use climbing gearing on my bicycles. So that's the cassette I use. I use the Altegra or on my other bike, the uh, Dura Ace Di2 uh, group sets i really enjoy the di2 it's just dead on accurate quick responsive sharp every single time i really enjoy the di2 i prefer it over the sram group sets i don't personally think that the sram shifting pattern is intuitive i really don't like it i prefer the uh, shimano that's just me i'm going to be a shimano person also I don't quite trust wireless shifting. I, I just feel like for me mentally, having these wires in here is, is a little bit more reliable and trustworthy than something completely wireless. Maybe that's a little bit short-sighted of me, but that's just my personal preference. And that brings me to the only downside of the DI2 is you have to be very careful when you're transporting bikes. When you're riding it, you can just ride it. But if you're transporting it, throwing it in and out of the back of your car, putting it in a bike bag, just be very cognizant of these wires because you can break them internally or you can uh, damage these ends. So if there is one downside, I have broken one wire and I learned from that and I never broke one after that. Uh, it could ruin your day if you break one of your DI2 wires. So that's enough about that, let's move forward. Talking about the uh, front chain rings real quick, again, talking about a compact uh, crank set. 
that's the gearing I run, climbing gearing, and as a smaller rider that doesn't produce as much uh, raw power as maybe a larger rider or a male rider, I don't really seem to run out of gears in the 5011. In terms of power meter pedals, I use my power meter pedals as kind of a sense check, check for my indoor trainer. I calibrate uh, both the power meter pedals and the, um, the trainer every couple of rides, and it's good to notice if one of them might be off. They're usually within five watts or so of each other. I get a little drive train loss in the back at the trainer, which is to be expected, but I know something is off. A, by feel, and B, if I start to see some variation in those numbers, I know it's time to force a calibration or maybe my calibration has gone wrong. I use the Vector 2 uh, power meter pedals. They do have the pedal dynamics. I've had them for years. I'm extremely happy with them. I've had great experiences with the Garmin pedals. They're accurate, they're responsive. They have really good battery life. The only thing I don't like are these pods. They're a little ugly. Uh, this isn't where the actual strain gauges are. This is where the communications are. So these talk to each other and the head unit and all the guts are actually inside the spindle here. But they use Look Keo pedals or cleats. Um, and uh, I really enjoy them personally. I've had no issues with them. Uh, I have had Garmin products for a long time and I am a happy customer. So moving up front here, uh, I'll just show you kind of on the front wheel, the riser setup. I have two of these Cyclops. Uh, these are climbing blocks or risers. They lift the wheel up, I think a little bit under six inches, but with one of them, and then you can stack two of them to get, I think 10 or 12 inches off the ground. So it would give you a really aggressive front end lift so that if you want to simulate the climbing position, the reason I have one under there right now is it shifts your weight a little bit further back and because of I'm just starting to bear weight and move my shoulder a little bit more as you can see if I'm in that really aggressive position and I start to get fatigued I will lean more on my shoulder than I probably should so moving my weight back in the saddle with the slight climbing position helps me to keep to force less weight onto my arm and more weight back into the saddle area uh, the hammer trainers do come with this guy here this is a wheel stabilizer this just kind of keeps the wheel from turning side to side it just kind of digs into your mat or whatever you might have on the ground carpet towel just so if you're wrenching on the bars you don't get that spin in the front wheel so this is if you want everything flat i will use something like this for more of my high intensity interval sets one more quick stop before i get off the floor we've got of course the infamous towel that you should have on the front of your bike i don't cover my handlebars or my stem because I don't drip really any sweat when I'm riding. But if I do get maybe a little bit of sweat here in my hairline, or more often if it's cold or sinus season, you get a little bit of that runny nose, that's where the towel comes in handy. So I just leave that draped on my front wheel. And then I use the Garmin HRM Tri heart rate monitor. I also have a Wahoo ticker. I like both, I find both to be reliable. This is my primary use here. And I've noticed with the uh, Garmin heart rate monitors, I get about 10 months of battery life with moderate to heavy use. So I'm pleased with them. I find them to be comfortable. I use these soft straps and uh, they also have the running dynamics built in things like cadence versus vertical oscillation and so on and so forth. So for data junkies, that's really some neat information to have. So next up here in the cockpit, I have my head unit. This is the Garmin Edge 1030. I really enjoy the big, bright, vibrant screen. It's great for mapping and other features outside, but specifically for indoors, I use the uh, head unit for two reasons. Number one, because of the pedal dynamics that are available from the vector pedals uh, to be able to record that and send it to Garmin Connect for later review. Uh, that is impossible right now with the Zwift files and the trainer road files, so it requires to be recorded here. The second thing is just having a redundant backup of my files. So I might have to take an extra minute uh, after each ride to delete the extra files, but just in case uh, something like Zwift over here decides to go ahead and uh, not focus, but decides to go ahead and not record my ride or send it over to Garmin Connect, I do have the backup that I can use for my training peaks and other fitness trackers. And then as you can see under here in front of my bars, I have my trainer desk. So I use a wireless keyboard. This is just a real cheap Logitech with a built-in uh, trackpad. I can use that to control uh, Zwift or Trainer Road or Spotify or any of the programs I wanna use on my computer while I'm riding right here in front of me. So I just leave that right within arm's reach. 
I also store things like my remotes up here. I can put my phone or camera up here. And then I usually just keep a little spare nutrition up here on the desk at all times, just in case I start to feel a little hungry or bonky. I have a few different options available so I don't have to get out or get off the bike and I can get through my workout. The last thing, which I don't use very often anymore, but I have this uh, little bit of a adjustable arm. I can put my tablet in here, and if I wanna watch video or use something with my hands while I'm riding, especially for those endurance rides, I can just drop the tablet in this little uh, adjustable arm here and put it within reach of my right hand. And then as you can see, I am set up really close to my primary TV here. This is my Samsung QLED UHD, uh, it's a 65 inch TV, so it's definitely really big, but it's in 4K, which gives you a lot of nice detail. It's nice and smooth. And the nice thing is that if, especially if you're in a, a workout or a race, you can see kind of some of the stuff we have listed on the side, like riders and, and gaps and power, as well as over here, if you're looking at things like uh, either the, the listing for the KOM points or where you, if you have like your workout information here, it just makes everything nice and big and easy to read, especially if you're a little glycogen depleted. Sometimes some of the stuff, if it's on a small screen or even something like a tablet, gets really tough to read. So it's really nice to have it on the big screen if you have the capability to do that. Uh, it really is a nice to have and it makes it a nice experience. And then lastly down here, the sound that I get through either music or podcasts, I just produce through these to their surround sound uh, Bose speakers with a uh, subwoofer down there, produces great quality sound. And then I just kind of run that in tandem with either my Zwift or Trainer Road with my podcast, my playlists for music or anything in between. And it's a really nice experience. But here we are watching some uh, A Roman climb away here. So good job A Roman pushing 3.7 watts per kilogram. And then we'll pan back here a little bit, look at the whole setup here, because I want to talk about one of the most underappreciated elements of a training setup, but one of the most important, and that is your cooling. I use two of these Vornado fans. They are not particularly cheap. They are between $60 and $70 a piece. I actually bought one, and then I loved it so much that I checked for an Amazon warehouse deal and got the second one super cheap with a damaged box. So I really love these fans. They're about 12 or 14 inches somewhere in there in diameter. They're a small footprint. You can see I place them on kind of an extra chair and my cajon here, cause you know, who doesn't use a cajon as a fan stand? But these things push out a lot of power. In fact, if you've got some furry friends and these fans, they are very powerful. They act like a vacuum. So make sure you take a few minutes to check every month or so to make sure that the hair doesn't build up back there and get that nice and cleaned out. But they are fantastic fans, super strong, and they do a great job keeping me cool on my rides. And what classy setup would not be complete with a couple of Ant Plus adapters just thrown on the floor a couple feet away from my bike? I just roll this up when I'm done and tuck it next to my computer, but these two extension cords, just put the Ant Plus adapters within four or five feet of the bike for best possible connection and lack of interference from the computer. So that's the end of the road here, folks. That is my trainer setup for the 2019 to 2020 season. I probably won't be seeing the outdoors for a couple of months once I get the strength back in the arm and then I luck out with some weather. Hopefully sometime around March, I can sneak in a couple of outdoor rides, but this is the setup that I will be seeing the most of uh, for the next three to four months. So that is my indoor trainer setup. Please share yours in the comments down below what you're using or what you'd love to be using and answer that question of the day. If somebody gave you a thousand dollars tomorrow to spend on your indoor trainer setup what would you buy first so please hit the thumbs up button if you like this video it really does help the video and the channel subscribe if you haven't already hit that little notification bell if you want to be like the cool kids and have lots of notifications on your phone even though I don't post that many videos and I will catch you guys in the next one see you